What else? What else we got? Anything else? Okay. Well, uh, as a kind of reminder, last week we, we really spent class talking about case formulation and talking about kind of the importance of case formulation, some of the basic aspects or pieces to that, and kind of how that then starts to inform our ability to effectively uh, take our knowledge of what's happening and move it into the intervention stage. So just like with, you know, last week, if you have any questions as we go, feel free to uh, chime in, ask those, chime in via chat, kind of whatever is easiest for you to do, totally fine with me doing. So, you know, where we had left off was talking about kind of case formulation as this wardrobe, right? So this, this um, complete dressed up picture of an individual, the problems that they're having, why they're having those problems. And then we can start taking to the next step, which is okay, how do we intervene with those problems? So when we're talking about, you know, working with children, working with adolescents, you know, we're really talking about understanding not just them as an individual, but also the various things in their external environment. Family, school, peer relationships. In other words, all the different kinds of systems in which they're embedded. And then understanding why are the problematic symptoms they're experiencing showing up at this particular point? What is it about their developmental and learning history? What is it about their cultural and familial space? What is it about cognitive and behavioral aspects, emotional aspects that are kind of all coordinating to produce this um, psychopathology in the child, right? So the problems that the child is experiencing. So when we start understanding the relationship between these things, that's when we really start getting this this wonderful, full, rich picture of what we would call the formulation, their story, their ideographic psychological portrait. And putting those puzzle pieces together, right? how do these things all fit together? How does this information all come together is your first step in doing any sort of good therapy. Because again, like we talked about last week, if I don't know what's wrong with something, how can I fix it? I'm just guessing. I'm just shooting wildly in the dark as opposed to saying, oh, there's my target. And so understanding those kind of core pathological processes that are at play for each child, adolescent, individual is key. And so when we think about those kind of, again, what we call those core pathological processes, what we're really talking about from a cognitive behavioral perspective is the maladaptive aspects of, so in other words, what's going wrong with, and then how are these things interacting together of behavior, cognition, and emotion. And we're then trying to really look for what are the triggers that are causing those maladaptive features to come up in, uh, either internally or in the external environment. So we had looked at kind of, you know, one visual representation of what that looks like. I'll bring that back up just as a reminder. So uh, talking about how again, cultural context, history and development, behavior, cognitions, all kind of then come together within what's called the present problem. Whether you call it depression or anxiety or disordered eating or oppositional behavior or anorexia or whatever it happens to be, this is a good model for you to kind of understand what's happening. Another one, and probably my favorite way to visualize this in a, a useful way uh, is by looking at and visualizing different aspects of emotion, cognition, behavior, and how those interact with each other. Uh, that Dave Tolan uses in his book, Doing CBT. So my advanced counseling folks, my uh, 
they've already seen this, I know, but it's a good reminder. So when we're, when we're really trying to break problems down, low self-esteem, uh, problem behavior at school, things like that, if we just say them in these broad terms, it really doesn't give us a whole lot of information. Um, even just saying something like disordered eating doesn't give us a whole lot of information because disordered eating can look a lot of different ways. It can look like someone who is restricting the amount that they eat. It can look like someone who is binging and then purging. It can look like someone who's just binging. It can look like someone who is restricting the types of foods that they eat. So we really have to break something like that down into these core aspects. What are the emotional, behavioral, and cognitive components of this problem? So one thing that many people are familiar with as a kind of psychological symptom are what's called panic attacks. And if someone says, oh my gosh, I had a panic attack the other day, you all as advanced students, you know, advanced graduate students, probably come up with an idea in your head immediately of what did that panic attack look like? You think, oh, they did this, they felt this way, they experienced this sort of thing. Which may be accurate, or it may not. As it turns out, panic attacks look extraordinarily different from person to person and from time to time within a person. So instead of just assuming, hey, I know what a panic attack looks like, or hey, I know what depression looks like, what we really need to do is we need to start breaking that down into these core aspects. So with the panic attack, for example, when we talk about the emotional components of panic attacks, what is that generally, and then what is it specifically for this individual I'm working with? So in general, we think things like fear, having my heart racing, but it could also be things like sweating, it could be feeling dizzy, it could be my stomach hurting. If there's a whole lot of different emotional components that go into that, so which ones is it for this person? Just like with, say, depression. Depression looks different from person to person. That's why it's not just like, oh, here's the two symptoms of depression. It's diagnostically speaking, oh, here's these nine symptoms you have to have, you know, five of them sort of thing. So what's the emotional component? Okay, well, for this person, it's feeling, you know, very, very fearful and afraid, feeling like their heart is racing. Okay, great. Well, what sort of cognitive components are you playing? You know, what are they thinking about? Well, they're thinking, oh my God, I'm having a panic attack. Like something's wrong with me. Something, something's terribly uh, problematic that's happening. Okay, well, what's happening behaviorally? All right, how is their behavior becoming problematic, you know, away from the norm, as a result of this panic attack. Well, they're seeking reassurance. Oh my God, oh my God, am I gonna be okay? They're going to the ER, or having the parents take them to the ER. Maybe they're escaping from the situation that they became um, upset about or you know, fearful in, or they're just avoiding that same sort of situation in general. And like, what's going on there behavior? Because when we start breaking that down, that really helps us to understand what's going on with this person. But this is still just kind of a, a problem formulation. Right? So we're just really talking about the problem. And so what we need to start looking at is we need to start putting the other pieces together to understand what's going on. So for example, what's the trigger to this panic attack? Right? What was happening immediately prior to this panic attack? Was it a particular social situation? Was it thoughts you were having? Was it a physiological sensation? Was it something someone said to you? What was it that was occurring there? And thinking about, okay, well, in addition to those direct kind of trigger behavioral variables, were there other things at play that made me perhaps focus my attention in a way that was maladaptive or inappropriate? So for example, we know that a lot of people with panic attacks have this very, very strong focus on their bodily sensations. And they pay excessive, overly, you know, kind of critical attention to 
what's my body feeling like right now? So here's an example. Um, I have a, a hobby farm. I have like five acres, I have animals. We're constantly doing stuff on it. Um, and a lot of that stuff is very physically intensive, right? So if I'm hauling mulch or I'm chopping wood or I'm building a fence or I'm wrestling pigs or whatever it happens to be that needs to happen. Um, I only wrestle the pigs for fun, right? It's not like it's being me, just so everybody knows. Like, we all have a good time. Um, but if I was prone to panic attacks and I was out there doing this, you know, pretty hard physical labor, I would have symptoms like maybe feeling short of breath or feeling a little bit dizzy. And me, not being prone to panic attacks, I have those symptoms and I think like, man, I'm getting old, or man, I need to, you know, do more cardio work instead of just, you know, muscle work because, like, I need, I need more, more breath here. But if I'm prone to panic attacks, what I'm going to think is very different. And I'm going to have that same kind of trigger, maybe feel dizzy, feel out of breath, but then I'm going to interpret it very differently. And I'm going to be like, oh no, what's going on? Is there something wrong? There's something wrong. This is different, so it's wrong. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. This might mean that I'm having a panic attack. And I remember those other panic attacks I've had in the past, and I really don't like those, and they're really bad, which in turn is going to start this emotional component, right? Rolling together with this cognitive component, which is going to then start driving these maladaptive behaviors. Okay, I'm just going to not come outside anymore and work hard. Or, oh, I'm just going to, you know, avoid taking the stairs. I'm just going to have to ride the elevator from now on because I was feeling a little out of breath, and that means I may have had a panic attack. So we, we take those core processes, those pathological aspects, and we start looking at, okay, what's actually causing those? Both in terms of the direct triggers, yes, but we start expanding it to see, okay, well, what about those other aspects that we talked about in our, our formulation? So what about their learning history? And their developmental history. Hmm. Well, then we can start thinking of okay, well, what kind of classical or operant conditioning is at play right now that helped develop this problem in the first place and that's helping to maintain this problem? So perhaps, for example, I've been classically conditioned that if I start feeling dizzy, it means a panic attack is coming. So therefore, I'm feeling dizzy, and I've automatically conditioned to expect a panic attack to occur. So I start getting more anxious, more nervous, more worried, which of course just makes a panic attack more likely to occur. So we start building from the center, right, from those core pathological processes, and we start building out to a more full picture of that entire wardrobe, like we talked about earlier. And we start looking at what are the aspects that are influencing these emotional, cognitive, and behavioral responses that are maladaptive. So yeah, sure, I've got some classical conditioning at play that's impacting and driving those emotional responses. But I also have these cognitive variables in play. So I have you know, perhaps this learning history of, um, oh my gosh, you know, well, I remember my grandpa had a heart. Is that what he felt like? Oh my gosh, that's really scary because I'm, I, I, I could die. And then thanks to that learning history, I might have some memory biases in play. Where I start thinking about, oh my gosh, well, these other people in my family also had these problems. Or I saw in the news that you know, the number one killer of people in America is you know, a heart attack or heart failure. And those things are going to start driving, it turns out, those maladaptive cognitions, especially when you put those together with what we call core beliefs or core schemas about who I am as a person, about what the world's like, and about what the future's like, kind of these big three aspects of identity. And if I have these beliefs that, oh my gosh, like I'm, I'm not very strong, I'm very vulnerable to 
whatever kind of danger we're talking about, then all of a sudden that's really going to be driving those maladaptive cognitive responses to those emotional aspects that you're having because of this particular trigger in your environment. And then we start adding on, okay, well, what's happening at a behavioral level that's driving these processes further? So when I look at me escaping from the situation or seeking reassurance, what impact is that having on me? Right? So for example, when I escape from a situation that makes me feel anxious and nervous, I tend to have a reduction in fear. I feel better. Right? And I feel better because of the negative or unpleasant has been removed. And when something unpleasant is removed, and it increases the chance of me doing the behavior again, what do we call that? Negative reinforcement? Negative reinforcement, which means that behavior of escape or seeking reassurance is just going to be what? More likely to occur. Exactly. But that's not the only impact of something like an escape or an avoidance behavior. What we also see is that when I escape or avoid those situations, what it does is it feeds back into these cognitive aspects, into these core beliefs that that's too scary for me to handle. I can't handle this. This is a terrible thing that occurred. Which means I learn that I need to fear when I have shifts or changes in my bodily sensations. And that then feeds back into these triggers. And the next time I experience one of these triggers of a change in a bodily sensation, I'm likely to have an excessive focus on it, have maladaptive cognitive responses to it, and have maladaptive behavioral responses to it. So this is an example of how we would put together something like, how do I, from a cognitive behavioral standpoint, conceptualize a panic attack? what's causing it, what's maintaining it, what are the problems associated with it, and how do they all fit together. So, process that for a second. There's a lot going on. Right? There's a lot going on. There's a lot of pieces working together, a lot of things you have to assess. So ask questions. What are your thoughts? What are your responses? Questions. You're all still looking at all those arrows, aren't you? You're like, my God. I thought he said to keep these conceptualizations as simple as possible. Well, I did, and this actually is about as simple as possible because of all these different variables that we're trying to take into account. I think for me, it all makes sense, but my question is like, how do I figure this out? If someone comes to me and has these problems, how does one create all of this? <laughs> great, great question. Um, and and the, the good news is that you don't have to create all of this yourself. Right? Um, so it's not as if when you're a good, for example, well-trained, evidence-based clinician, that you're going into each new client saying, like, I have no idea what's going on. Instead, what you're doing is you're going into each client saying, here is my general way that we, from a scientific perspective, understand psychopathology. And we understand it as being disruptions in these three major areas, emotion, cognition, and behavior. And we understand that those three areas are what I build out from. So I ask specifically about those areas emotion, cognition, behavior, and the maladaptive aspects from each. Now, does that mean that I have to start by saying, okay, I'm gonna ask you about every single symptom in the DSM, and then we'll go from there. Right. No, no, because that would take hours and hours and hours. But this is the main reason why we do a lot of intake work, right, that asks very broadly about tons of different areas of functioning so that we can start having an idea of 
what are the emotional, behavioral, and cognitive symptoms that someone is experiencing? So, you know, when someone comes in and they say, well, I'm depressed, they're like, oh, God, who knows what that looks like? Well, I don't know exactly what it looks like for this person, but I know here are the general symptoms of depression. Let's see which ones this person's experiencing by asking about them by getting some sort of assessment of them. Okay, my kid's having, you know, bad behavior where they're arguing a lot at home. Okay, well, arguing a lot at home can mean a lot of different things. So let's break that down into specifics. Like, what are we talking about with emotion? Like, what are we talking about with their specific behavior? What's this arguing look like? Uh, when is it happening? Um, how has it happened before? Where would they have potentially learned that sort of behavior? Right? What's happening when they do that? So once you start with those kind of those three core pieces, you can start then looking at the rest of this to say, okay, well, what are the aspects that are influencing these? And that's why nice visual representations like this are so lovely because they give you a map of what all to look for. So once I start understanding what these core components or disruptions are, I can then, thanks to our theory and decades of research on psychopathology, start understanding, okay, well, if someone is having, let's say, these kinds of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral symptoms, okay, well, from a, you know, a cognitive behavioral perspective, we have a lot of research on depression. So what kinds of core beliefs do we see in people with depression? What kinds of memory biases do we see? What kinds of attentional biases? What kinds of you know, potential skill deficits or contingencies are often at play there? So you don't have to go into it completely blind, in other words, right? Where it's just like, who knows what's going on? But, well, you know, we assess those core components first and then based on our research literature, we have a good idea of what are these other aspects that are happening that I need to at least ask about right, to kind of build my case in my knowledge. Did that answer your question, Kajin? Does that help you a little bit or no? Yeah, okay. Now, this is not an easy process. Um, our you know, counseling students started seeing uh, Clients in the clinic last semester started building these case formulations. Was it super easy to do? Counseling students, talk to us about that. Uh, I thought it was difficult to like start plugging in all of the information, um, but I feel like what I found is that like once you can start piecing some of it together, then the rest of it flows more naturally because you then you know what to ask as follow-ups and then you can put in you know the more information that you get and then it, like the whole picture kind of starts to come together great response gabriel great response what about what about your other folks that have seen patients last month i agree with gabe um i thought once you start like asking questions it's pretty easy to uh, to start filling in those blanks. Um, like one client with panic attacks specifically, once they start talking about it, you kind of figure out where they were, you figure out what they did after it and things like that. Um, for me, I thought the hardest things to fill in were like the learning history and um, sort of like memory biases and those things that they don't readily tell you. So those are the things that I had to kind of go back and ask more about. Yeah, a lot of have to almost infer a little bit at first, right? Because someone's not going to be coming in and being like, well, so here's my attentional and memory biases. And I think these are really making me feel bad, right? Like no one, literally no one comes in and says that. It's through their responses, their actions, their history that you start figuring out what those are, right? Because I can't, like, I can't just be like, oh, hey, hey, Samantha, come in and tell me about all the memory biases you have. It's going to be like, well, what the hell are you talking about? Like, I don't, I don't even know what that means, you know, as an everyday patient. Um, Samantha knows what it means. 
it's because you're not studying these things. Uh, but so that's that's a great point, Holly. Is that those those things are particularly, I think, uh, difficult at first to really think what's going on here. But the more and more that you learn about these syndromes, these collections of problems, you'll see that that there are some pretty repeated patterns. So behavioral, for example, with depression and anxiety, one of our major behavioral patterns that we see is escape and avoidance. And so people tend to be escaping or avoiding situations. Okay, that's helping them feel better, right? But it just in the short run, they can feel worse over the long run. So we can start knowing like those are behavioral components that someone's likely to be engaging. Um, or when I see people with OCD, for example, um, I consult pretty regularly with people around the nation, uh, clinicians who are seeing people with OCD for really complex or, or difficult cases. And I don't have to necessarily, you know, interview people for an hour and a half to understand the likely processes that are happening when they have OCD. Because I've seen thousands of people with OCD at this point. And that doesn't make me an expert, just seeing those people, right? What makes me an expert is knowing the research literature that's out there and being able to apply that understanding of our scientific you know, knowledge of OCD generally. So I can say, okay, well, they're likely doing these things that they're not telling you about because they probably don't realize that those related to their OCD. So just like Holly said, you know, they're not going to come out and say, here's my memory bias, here's my attentional bias, here's my learning history, right? Uh, but you're going to be able to see that the more and more that you interact with them. So this is, again, you know, this is this is a, a complex process for sure. It's not a, uh, an easy thing to do immediately. But this is your, your base skill where if I can conceptualize a case well, I can then take the next steps into actually intervening. Other thoughts or questions right now? Would you do all of this during your intake interview or during the first interview? You start it during your intake interview. Uh, but you're very unlikely to get all the information that you would need just during that intake. And instead, what's likely to happen is you do the intake interview, you come back, you'll be thinking about conceptualizing this, writing this up, filling out a diagram, and be like, oh, here's the parts that I don't have. Like, here's the missing pieces. I'm not sure what, you know, let's say, what the trigger was, because they weren't sure. Or I'm not sure if they have skill deficits that are making it difficult for them to do this or do that. And so that then starts setting up, here's what I do over my first couple of sessions which is, is really solidifying that formulation, you know, really understanding. Because most people that we see come in and they don't just have uh, one problem that they're dealing with. It turns out that diagnostically comorbidity, having two or more concurrent diagnoses is the rule, not the exception. Um, and especially that's true when people seek help, right? Uh, so, you know, I'm trying to let me think for a second. So, um, people that I saw over the last week, like patients that I saw over the last week. So, I had one person who came to me because they have um, OCD as a, as a specific diagnosis, but they also have uh, self injurious behavior, so cutting. Uh, they also have very high levels of disordered eating. Uh, and they've got a whole bunch of other stuff that you know could be generally qualified as generalized anxiety or major depressive disorder. So there's a whole other morass of symptoms. So when I do, you know, my my conceptualization, it's not just for depression. Right? It's to be my conceptualization of uh, what's called Sue. It's my conceptualization of Sue and the problems that Sue is experiencing. So I wouldn't only put the OCD components in here, right? I would put 
components of OCD, generalized anxiety, disordered eating, and the self-injurious behavior. And those would all be worked into my conceptualization of soup. And there will probably be pieces that I place more of an emphasis on, for sure. But all of that's going to kind of go in there to that. I didn't get that just in one, you know, 75-minute intake session. And it took, took about two and a half sessions before she was really comfortable opening up about all of the stuff that she was experiencing. And that was from somebody who'd been in therapy, she said, since for like the last 10 years. Um, not with me obviously but with somebody else uh, and you know when i shared because that's part of what we do sharing my conceptualization of what's happening to her, she said no one had ever done that with her before no one had ever talked to her about why is she having the problem she's having right what's maintaining this problem uh, and it became very obvious that no one had ever done evidence-based therapies with her uh, which is very sad but i'm glad so, yeah, it's tough. Something that I learned when we started doing a case formulation for my client last semester is that they had some ADHD um, and some anxiety. And I was like, well, like, which one do I do? Like, which one do I lean into trying to fix? And you had mentioned that their problem was most likely anxiety, which was just giving them some of the symptomatology of ADHD. But if we worked on the anxiety first, then we would see if the ADHD also diminished. And that was super helpful because I did the intake and I was like, they've got this and this and this, like, how do I sort? And kind of going, well, if this one affects the others and we bring that down, we'll see if that just kind of solves some of the confusion over here. And that's, I, I think that that's a, that's a great point, Andrew, which is that problems are very rarely discrete, right? Um, even if you have problems across multiple areas of life, they're very rarely not connected to each other. So um, this young lady, for example, she's got the cutting behavior, the non-suicidal self-injury. Uh, it's not just like some free-floating problem. It's a coping mechanism that she uses when she's experiencing extraordinarily high levels of stress and anxiety. So do we need to target that specifically for her? No, we need to target the stress and anxiety that she's experiencing, which will cause that to go down without us having to directly do anything about it. And most of that anxiety and stress that she's experiencing is coming from, guess what? Her, obsess her, her intrusions and obsessive thoughts that are then causing her to lose hours and hours of her life to compulsions. So do we need to target the stress and anxiety? No, we need to target what's causing that. Okay? And we target that and we'll see this, this uh, kind of snowball effect of changes that happen down this entire kind of corridor of emotional, cognitive, and behavioral problems. Because we have a good understanding of what's driving Right. What are the relationships between these things? And that's exactly what Andrew is talking about. Right. And it's it's crucial to see these things in relationship to each other, as opposed to seeing them as some sort of unique, special snowflakes out there floating around, not touching each other. No, they're all together in a big snowball of psychopathy. So that I just came up with. So you're welcome, Elijah. Question. So, so would you say that like the 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 comorbidity of, of uh, diagnosis is, is prevalent because of the similarities and the overlap within the DSM criteria for di diagnosis? Yeah, so um, comorbidities in terms of diagnoses happen definitely because um, there's overlap in symptom, right? So generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder have a huge overlap in the number of symptoms they have. So just by having one, you have a very significant chance to qualify for the other. Um, so that's one way that that happens. Right? But the other way that we see, or kind of main reason why I see these comorbidities is because one cluster of symptoms is leading to the problems that get you diagnosed with the other cluster. So 
um, huge numbers of people, for example, that have trichotillomania, uh, compulsive hair pulling, uh, also have very, very large problems with depression and social anxiety. And a lot of the times, the trichotillomania is what came first. And that led then, because now I'm embarrassed about how I look, or I'm worried that other people are going to be looking at me or judging me, that then leads to these other diagnoses you can get, you know, uh, you know kind of comorbidly diagnosed with. Okay. It so they exist separately. So kind of like how uh, panic disorder can, can lead to like agoraphobia or something like that. Yeah, exactly, or vice versa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not always, you know, here's the thing that happens first, but then the disorder that happens second. We can see, you know, this bi directional nature. So, for example, if someone has trichotillomania and then they develop symptoms of social anxiety as a result of that, there's a really good chance that those social anxiety symptoms are going to feed back into what caused your trichotillomania to begin with, making it worse, which then in turn makes your social anxiety worse. But if I don't know kind of what started which one, then I won't know where the target effectively is going to go effectively first. Okay, so those those positive feedback loops just kind of start to bleed over into to a lot of other aspects of life for a lot of people, it seems. Uh, yes, yes, with both within the symptomology that you're having, as well as your interactions with your peers, your family, the teachers, that all starts interacting, which is why when you look at something like this, uh, you know, this diagram here, you'll notice that these arrows and these gears are all interacting with each other. It's not just, oh, emotion causes behavior, which causes cognition. No, these things are all happening at once. They're all driving each other. But what that means is that when we target one of these aspects, we're targeting all of them, right? So I don't necessarily have to hit the emotion, cognition, and behavioral aspects, you know, in order to see changes in all of them. I can, for example, hit the behavioral aspects. For example, someone who has depression here, one of our most effective treatments for that is called behavioral activation. Uh, it's a wonderful protocol, but it's evidence-based for, you know, kiddos through adults through elders um, and it's not directly targeting the cognitive or the emotional components it's only directly targeting this behavioral component but what we see from our outcome literature are then changes in your emotions and changes in your cognitions purely by changing your behavior so it's got like a ripple effect um yeah on how one single thing can affect a lot of other things. Very much so. Uh, because this is all an interconnected system, right? Just like when, um, let's say, let's say that I get, uh, I get sick. Let's say I get the flu, right? My body and my brain are all an interconnected system, right? So when I get the flu, it doesn't just impact my white blood cells. It doesn't just impact uh, my ability to breathe well, right? It impacts my entire body, right? From head to toes. And it's the same thing when we're talking about the psychopathological symptoms. So we know, for example, that problems with your emotion, cognition, and behavior can result in very severe physical problems and vice versa, right? So when you, for example, exercise, um, exercise causes changes in your emotional state. And we know this from wonderful research out there that shows that uh, 20 minutes to 25 minutes of moderate exercise three times a week is as or more effective than any antidepressant medication on the market for people who have depression. Uh, and the research is very clear on that. Why? We're not directly targeting your depressive behaviors, your cognitive status, your emotions. No, but we're targeting other systems that are related to that. And we're actually probably targeting some of the behavioral aspects as well, including things like regulation and routine. Uh, but we're not directly targeting. 
but we still see changes, just like we see changes here in these other systems by targeting one. It's, it's kind of like in behavior in ABA, we'll use what we call behavioral motive, I think in a deep behavioral motivation, but if we need a kid to do a task, um, and they're just not doing it, we'll ask them to, you know, give me a high five, pat your head, rub your tummy, write your name. And because we've given them these three easy tasks that they can do, or that that are pretty easy for them to do, they're more likely to then do the harder task. Yeah, because you're building up like, I can do these other things, right? Which is actually a core aspect, it turns out, of most cognitive behavioral therapies, is we don't ask you to start out doing something that's really, really hard. We start you by doing something that's easy, something that you can handle, so that you can increase your, um, you know, Victor would call it kind of inner locus of control. Right? I can make a change. I can do some things. It's not that things just happen to me. It's that I can happen to me. Uh, and then it makes you much, much more likely to then respond with the next request or be able to try the next thing out. Great example, Tristan. What else? Other thoughts, questions right now about this? Brianna's dog had a question earlier, but didn't get on the mic, so we'll never know what it was. I actually did have a question. Um, going back to the example that you gave, like in terms of anxiety, um, so you have all that information, then what do you what do you do with it? Like what would be the next step? Or is that getting ahead of myself? It's getting a little ahead of myself. So, okay. uh, <laughs> so the um, you know the big the big aspect that we do with our case formulation is first, hey, what's going on? Really? Why is it happening? Why is it being maintained? Because when we figure that out. Then we can start targeting these contingencies, these core beliefs, these uh, skill deficits, classical conditioning, attentional biases, or triggers. We can start then targeting so many different potential variables for intervention. But we won't know what to target unless we have a good case formulation. Uh, so that's kind of the next step we have is, okay, now we've got this understanding, now what do I do? So, for example, with this anxiety panic attacks, uh, okay, there's a lot of different things we can potentially address. So we could address the triggers by making sure that someone never has to do the thing this, that make them dizzy again. And that probably wouldn't be a very effective intervention, right, because then that's going to be really limiting of what they could do. Okay, well, we could target potential bias. And it turns out we can, right? We can actually do what's called attentional bias retraining, where we help people learn how to focus on different things than what they normally focus on. And that could have an impact. We could uh, target the contingencies here, right? So what are they doing? They're escaping from the situation. All right, well, let's do some exposure and response prevention where we gradually help them learn how to tolerate those problems or situations that are problems and learn that, hey, I don't, oops, sorry, I don't need to fear or be afraid of fear. Because a lot of times that's what panic attacks really are, is a fear of fear. Now, when I do that, I'm also then targeting these core beliefs and we're changing those core beliefs. We're also targeting the classical conditioning by doing that because we're breaking that association or extinguishing between this situation and having a panic attack. So we only know what to target and what to do because we've got such a good formulation. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Please? Now, again, the wonderful thing is that you don't have to figure all of this stuff out by yourself, right? It turns out we have 
wonderful, wonderful, you know, reams and reams of information, like all this stuff on my bookshelf about panic attacks and depression and disordered eating and oppositional behavior and OCD and body-focused repetitive behaviors that other researchers and clinicians have already learned and found. And that's actually why you all are doing your workshops that you're going to be doing starting in a few weeks. Because you're going to be sharing that information with the rest of the class. Right? Sharing, you know, here's how we conceptualize these problems and here's where we intervene and how we intervene effectively. So a lot of that's already figured out. So it's not quite as scary, I think, as it might seem at first, where you know, catch is like, how did we, how do we know these things? Well, it turns out we already do. It's just of putting them into play. Good questions. Good questions, folks. So this, you know, this is just a blank. Um, this is just a blank of exactly everything that we've been talking about. And it's a really useful blank to start filling in when you're seeing your own clients and conceptualizing those problems. And again, you don't have to know everything all at once. Case formulation is a ongoing process where, remember, we're testing our hypotheses and seeing are they confirmed or rejected by that information. So we're constantly revising and updating this case formulation. And that's exactly what we should do based on the new information that we get. It's not a one and done kind of thing. We start it, you know, when we first see uh, and interact with our, our clients, but it's continuous in nature. So, and this is all in the uh, you know, the handouts, the lecture notes there. So. Let's recap case formulation. So the first thing that you do is you take your presenting problems and you break it down into these discrete components, right? Uh, behavior, cognition, emotion, physiology. And then you start integrating various test data and other kinds of information that you've gotten from self-reports, parent reports, observational uh, data that you have, all the sort of data that you can gather and then you start incorporating, okay, well, what's the impact of cultural variables here? Both larger scale cultural variables and the distinct cultural variables of this family system. Okay, great. Let's add in that historical data or developmental data that we've got that may influence our conceptualization, our understanding. And then let's start talking about cognitive products. So schemas, processes, uh, core beliefs, you know, what sort of cognitive aspects are being added on? And then what are the behavioral aspects of play? Are there particular antecedents? What consequences are going on in maintaining or reinforcing this? When you do all of this, you really start to come up with, again, this really lovely picture of here's what's going on with this person and then I can start figuring out how do I intervene. And that's all of this together. That's, that's what we've got. And again, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a big process. Um, but although daunting at first, it does get much easier over time because a lot of how you think about these start, things start becoming very, uh, very automatic. So, so instead of just uh, having to really like, oh my God, I have to remember all these things at once. It's, oh, this just becomes natural for me to start asking about behavioral, cognitive, emotional aspects and integrating those uh, with cultural context, with historical and developmental context, putting it all together to have a, again, a really nice picture of what's going on. So, Let's take a break. All right, so we've been talking for about an hour, we're going pretty hard. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about what Brianna had asked about, which is moving from your case formalization to your treatment plan. All right, I'll see you all here in a minute.
All right. So we've talked, you know, last class and then you know, for the last hour here about case formulation. Hopefully, I've impressed upon the importance of doing so, right? Because it's it's critical, right? Because if we don't know what's going on, we don't know how to fix it. But like Brianna had asked about earlier, like, well, what do we do next? <laughs> what's our next step though? And that's, you know, what I want to talk about now, which is kind of that movement from, here's our case formulation, how we translate that into treatment plan. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about next. So let me share this. All right. So, so what your case formulation does is it really helps to guide the development of your treatment plan. Because what it does is it is allows us to tailor these nomothetic or generalized evidence-based treatments and interventions to highly very specific individuals. Right? So we take our nomothetic treatment and we make it into an ideographic treatment. Um, so, you know, I know how to treat, uh, let's say, social anxiety in adolescents, but how do I treat social anxiety in this particular adolescent? And that's really what we're talking about here with using that case formulation to develop this very specific treatment intervention. One of the other things that your case formulation really helps you do is identify what are called TIB or therapy interfering behaviors. You know, what are those things that are going to be obstacles or roadblocks between us and progress for this individual? And that might be things like financial issues, those could be legal issues, those could be um, some sort of cultural or communication-based issues. Those could be specific things about a person's psychopathology. Right? So um, in depression, one of the biggest therapy interfering behaviors is avoidance and withdrawal, which are key symptoms of depression. There are also some of those things that are likely to make your depression uh, worse as opposed to better by coming to treatment because you don't engage in the interventions. So case formulation is your step one. And then once we have that case formulation, then we start trying to combine and adapt your therapies that are nomothetic for this specific individual. And so your workshops throughout the semester that you'll be putting on, you'll be talking about these nomothetic interventions. Um, how do we do CBT for problematic sexual behaviors? How do we do um, parent management training for oppositional behaviors? How do we do et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Right? Like, what does that look like? That's going to be our nomothetic thing. So then your case formulation tells me how am I going to do parent management training for this particular client? Because most of our cognitive behavioral treatment uh, packages, uh, CBT for depression, CBT for OCD, they're really just combinations of different kinds of behavioral cognitive and emotional interventions that you're tailoring to your specific client. So when we say things like cognitive therapy for depression, what we're really talking about is tailoring our specific treatment for this person's depressive symptoms and intervening primarily at a cognitive level with specific intervention. When we talk about behavioral therapy for ADHD, we're saying, okay, we're gonna target these specific behaviors. Um, this is one of the things I think that gets lost in a bit of the translation for a lot of practitioners that are out there, um, particularly practitioners that don't have a really solid background in evidence-based training, is that when you're trained on how to do, let's say, for example, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy uh, for adolescents, you're being trained in how to do cognitive behavioral therapy for this specific group. But it's not somehow separate and unique from our larger umbrella of cognitive behavioral therapies. Right? It turns out it's a very large umbrella. 
because it's those therapies that embrace changing behavior and changing cognition through the use of specific evidence-based interventions to make people's psychopathology symptoms decline or decrease in some way. So when we take something like mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for anxiety, what we're doing is we're taking different components or different uh, types of interventions and putting them together in one package for someone with this kind of a problem. But some of those interventions or some of those components are going to be shared amongst ACT for adolescents who have depression or, uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy for socially anxious folks. All right, there are pieces that are going to be shared, which is why being trained in cognitive behavioral therapy allows you to be so flexible about what you do or do not treat. And so, your conceptualization, right, your case formulation, uh, is the key to be able to effectively choose which one of those interventions or which combinations of those interventions are most likely to work for the person that you're seeing. So there's a lot of different interventions. We're going to see a lot of those across the semester. Uh, but what you're going to see overall is that there's a lot of core skills that, regardless of what you're treating, for what population, that you're going to be using. And those include picking your targets effectively, sharing the treatment rationale, um, using what we call cognitive behavioral therapy finesse, structuring your session, and assigning good homework. And these are five core skills that you all will see throughout every single workshop that you do uh, and that you will be used for every single client that you see when you're doing good cognitive behavioral interventions in therapy. All right. Questions so far? They've put up an interesting picture, but I won't answer any questions so far. Everybody okay? Okay, well, let's talk about this picture that's on the screen right now. We have a plate with uh, a steak and a potato and some, some peas. Now, some of you are thinking that looks pretty delicious. Uh, some of you are thinking, I'm a vegan, uh, I'm just going to pretend that it's a, a tofu steak. And that's fine, whatever you're going to pretend. Um, but one of the questions that you know we often encounter when we're doing cognitive therapy is, Okay, if I've got these behavioral, cognitive, and emotional core processes, right, that have become maladaptive, which ones do I target first? Right? Which ones are likely to be the most effective to target, right? Do I do behavioral interventions, do I do cognitive, or do I do emotional interventions? And so, you know, a, a nice way to think about it was that if cognitive behavioral therapy was a meal, Behavioral interventions are going to be your main course. So doing behavioral level interventions should always be the first thing that you think of. It's going to be the biggest option on your plate. Cognitive interventions and emotional interventions, they're more side dishes. And so now some people only want to eat side dishes, right? Like you can go to Cracker Barrel and get a meal of nothing but side dishes. I know this because my parents love Cracker Barrel because they're old um, and, and they like food that doesn't have any flavor to it, um, which is fine. I don't judge them for that. Um, that's what happens, but you know, I'll go there too. I'll get some dumplings, it's fine. Uh, some people, you know, will be fine with just a side dish. Right? They just want a, a baked potato. And for the majority of us, we want that main dish, right? that main course. It's the same thing with intervening. Now, are there some people where I might you know, do the cognitive level intervention first. Maybe we'll start with the side dish. Maybe it's a little easier to eat, right? Maybe the main dish is too hot right now. We need to let it cool off a little bit. All right, well, we'll start with the side dish, and then we'll work our way into that. But for most of our problems, we're going to be starting at the behavioral level. Um, and again, because of the interconnectedness of behavior, cognition, and emotion, we can target those behaviors and change cognitions and emotions. Now you might say to yourself, okay, well, but if they're all interconnected, 
why can't we just target the cognitions, right? It should show the exact same change. Uh, and the main reason is because of the research. And the research is pretty clear out there that um, generally speaking, when we break these therapies down, we do what's called dismantling studies. The behavioral interventions are really what's driving the most change the most quickly, which is why we start with those. So it's not just a personal preference of mine and other researchers. It's, hey, this is what the research is telling us to do. This is what we start with because of the research. So in general, we're starting with our behavioral interventions. We're keeping the cognitive and the emotional ones in mind. And they're often, as you'll see throughout the semester in your workshops, integral parts of uh, your treatment packages. But we're starting with those behavioral ones. Now, this also really speaks to the fact that cognitive behavioral therapy is not just uh, this kind of one size fits all where everyone who comes in gets the exact same intervention. So for example, this, this young woman that I mentioned earlier who, uh, yes, has OCD, but also has self-injurious behaviors and depression and anxiety and all these other problems going on. Um, because of my formulation with her, right? So because of how I'm formulating her case, we actually started for her with cognitive intervention. And that was because of her motivation level and her symptom level, right? And her specific profile of symptoms. So usually when I treat someone who has OCD as a primary problem, we start with the behavioral level of conditions. But for her, we really couldn't do that for a number of reasons. So we need to start with the cognitive level to be able to work to the behavioral level. So it's not a one size fits all, right? Not everybody who walks in my door gets the exact same interventions in the exact same order for the exact same amount of time. And that's why CBT is so flexible is because we tailor it to their specific pathology, we tailor it to the needs that they have, and we tailor it to the abilities that they have. I don't ask people to do more than they're able to do. I often ask people to do more than they're comfortable with doing. But I don't ask people to do something that they can't do. Just like I don't ask my pigs on my farm to climb a ladder. So, you Doctor. Oh, oh, go ahead, Smith. I, I just wanted to ask because you said you targeted cognitive. Were you looking at like her core beliefs? Yes. So, okay. um, so this young lady uh, had been experiencing really significant anxiety since about six years old um, and had been experiencing a lot of that as a result of a lot of cultural variables for her. Um, and she was also very, um, she had a very good idea of what therapy was based on her last decade in therapy. And she thought it was just gonna be sitting here talking to someone new because she had never, Never had any sort of evidence-based interventions, never had any sort of homework assignments to do in between the therapy. Um, again, for 10 years, she'd been in therapy and she's as bad as she ever was. Um, so for a number of reasons, it was like, it was, that helps us with well, what Tristan you know, referred to earlier, behavioral momentum, um, where I can get her doing things like cognitive restructuring first, to start building some progress and some some uh, some self-efficacy for her to be able to then work into doing larger scale uh, behavioral changes like exposure with response prevention. So, um, so for her, definitely emphasizing the cognitive aspect first was the way to go. And she's very engaged now and she's very like, all about it and excited. Uh, because when I outlined general cognitive behavioral therapy for her <laughs> at her first uh, first intervention, her first meeting, she was like, whoa, 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 what's going on? Like, no one's ever talked to me about anything remotely like this. Um, and she's doing between six and ten hours worth of compulsions per day um, while working full time and, and going to school. 
So she doesn't have a whole lot of time, <laughs> you know, left in the day. So, um, so certainly the, the cognitive interventions were needed to help get her to the level where she could do the different interventions, which is not always the case for sure, which is why it's so individual. Good question, sir. Good question. Now, some folks that you interact with um, may need the entire meal, right? They need, they need cognitive, behavioral, and emotional level interventions. Some people may just need the behavioral level, the main course. Some people may just need a side dish, right? Um, and all of that depends on your formulation. So one young woman or young girl, actually, that I'm working with right now, who's 11, she uh, has some pretty, pretty severe delays developmentally, um, struggles a lot with uh, being able to express what she's thinking and what she's feeling. And so I couldn't really jump in and start doing anything like cognitive restructuring with her. And instead, we were doing a lot more of uh, just basic like labeling emotions, recognizing and identifying emotions and getting her to understand that first because she was very dichotomous right? i'm fine or i'm not fine <laughs> everything's good or i am melting down and everyone around me is going to be regretting this day right and so you know one of our very first things we work on her has to be okay well, let's let's talk about emotions let's talk about when you feel certain kinds of emotions uh, so you know, our interventions with her are going to be very different than they are with another 11-year-old who doesn't have these kinds of development delays that she has. And that's, again, the really, really cool part about cognitive behavioral therapy is how flexible it is. Because, you know, our theory allows us to flex what interventions we're doing based on the needs of the clients. It's not just everybody who walks in gets this exact same thing. Which is, as you'll read about uh, in the HUP book, what you see with a lot of pseudoscientific therapies. Which is everyone who walks in this door that I see gets this exact same intervention regardless of what your actual problems are. Um, so I see this all the time with practitioners of uh, EMDR, high movement desensitization retraining, where it's like, well, it doesn't matter what you have. What's going on? You need some EMDR. Um, and it's a good example of that old, you know, that old adage of if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right? If that's all you know how to do, well, then that's all you're going to do. But if I have an entire toolbox of different kinds of interventions, behavioral, cognitive, and emotional, then all of a sudden I'm much more flexible and much more likely to be able And that's kind of what this slide can show you, is all of the different types of interventions that one can use from this model. So, for example, we can do, like I mentioned earlier, attentional retraining, which directly targets, targets those attentional biases. We can do what we call stimulus selection or stimulus control which is all about changing the antecedents or changing the triggers. We can do things like exposure with response prevention to interfere with classical conditioning. We can do skills training if someone has a deficit on various kinds of skills, social skills, for example, personal skills, and so on. We can do things like contingency management to help shift what's happening after someone does we can do cognitive restructuring to directly target some of those core beliefs and maladaptive cognitive aspects. We can do what's called facilitated recall, which is a very specific kind of intervention where we um, try to disrupt memory bias. And then we can do things like relaxation training or acceptance uh, or mindfulness training to target emotional aspects and cognitive aspects. We can do what we call behavioral prescriptions or graded tasks or competing response training 
to directly target those maladaptive behavioral aspects. Not everyone that you see is going to need every one of these different kinds of interventions. Everybody's going to need different ones or different combinations of them. And that's where that case formulation comes into play is because based on which of these things are happening, that tells me what it is that I need to do. But this is, again, what's so amazing about cognitive behavioral therapy is that I don't have to know, know 50 different treatments for all these different specific diagnoses. Right? I don't have to know CBT for generalized anxiety, CBT for social anxiety, CBT for um, phobia, CBT for OCD, CBT for major depression, CBT. I don't have to know all of those specific treatments because they're really all one piece of a larger treatment set, which is what allows us to be so flexible and so effective with cognitive behavioral therapy. So talk to me, give me feedback. What do we think? What do we think about this? What is facilitated recall and like, how does that work? The facilitated recall is where you have someone specifically and explicitly recall things that go against where it is that they're likely to recall. Right? So, um, so Tristan, you actually had my psych science course where we talked about confirmatory bias a lot, right? Which is this, this natural thing that people do where what I'm more easily able to pay attention to and recall are those things that already fit with what it is I believe. So we see that in everyday life. We also see it in depression, anxiety, and so on. So when I'm depressed, I'm more likely to remember those things that fit my belief that the world is a bad place or I'm not a good person. So if we, in facilitated recall, we specifically have you recall instances that don't fit with that. So in other words, you start seeking this confirmatory information, just like we do as good scientists, right? We try and disprove our hypotheses. And that's what we're doing with facilitating recall. We're trying to disprove your memory that, oh, well, everything was terrible. Or nothing good has happened to me in the last month. It's like, okay, well, let's try and figure out if that's true or not. What else? What else we got? Other questions about interventions or, or this kind of general process? Does it, does it make sense how you shift from the case formulation to the interventions? Because these are the same things, right? So like if we have skill deficits that are driving our behavioral maladaptives, then ooh, well, we need to do some sort of training for that. If we have um, you know, a classical conditioning process that's driving those negative emotions, well, we can target that with something like exposure. So your core, your case formulation, then the parts of it that are the most prominent allow you to start saying, okay, which kind of intervention do I apply? What do we think? Everybody okay? It wasn't too confusing. I told you we get there. Brianna, did this answer your question from earlier? Yes, it did. All right. So I like to hear. All right. I had a quick question. Oh, and yes. In Marcy. The, the MFT, they talk about a lot um, about reflection, doing a lot of reflection and and not asking as many questions. But it seems like in this, you're asking quite a few questions. I mean, how do those two fit together? So, um, so certainly, like I, as a cognitive behavioral therapist, I do a lot of reflecting of emotion and the content. 
right? Uh, because one of the things that that does is that helps build a very solid therapeutic relationship. And so if we go back to, to this kind of a picture, see that plate that's underneath everything? That's our therapeutic relationship. Uh, if I don't have that, then guess what? The meal falls apart, right? It's all over my lap. It's rolling on the floor. It's being eaten by the dog. So what I'm talking about in this class is a lot of, of this, this the stuff that we build, we put on the plate, right? Um, now, in terms of asking questions, uh, I know that some of our other classes in here, uh, in this department, people basically were told you can't ask questions or you can't write things down in a therapy session or things like that, all of which are patently ridiculous. Um, and the reason for that is that if you don't ask questions, then you don't get any of the information that you need to be able to figure out what it is that I do. Now, are my, are my sessions just like one rapid fire question after another? No, right? They're a mix of, especially early on, building that therapeutic alliance, right? Putting that plate together, but also figuring out what's going on with self. Because we have decades of research at this point showing that the therapeutic alliance is, is crucial, right? A good collaborative um, relationship is crucial. But it is not in and of itself sufficient to cause change above and beyond the placebo level. So therapists who are purely relying on things like reflection and saying a relationship is all that matters, they're what I call placebo therapists. The relationship matters, and it matters a lot. Like, I ask people regularly to do things that they are incredibly uncomfortable that they have not done for years, right? that they don't want to do. And if they didn't have trust in me, we didn't have a solid relationship, do you think they would do those things? No, they wouldn't, right? In any way, shape, or form. But I can't just have their relationship. Relationship's a foundation, but then we have to build the rest of the house, right? We have to put stuff on the plate. So yes, things like doing reflection, to, and using active listening or what we call micro counseling skills are crucial. But that's not where you stop. That's where you start. Does that make sense? Yes, yes it does. Other, other thoughts, other thoughts, other questions? I think that that was really a good point to talk about. This is the doing. This is like even just seeing like the cogs and all the arrows, like it's just all like this is the work, like the continuous work. And um, I'm glad that you touched on the relationship piece because I saw that on the plate and I thought, oh, OK, yeah, yeah, I see that. But then hearing you talk about it, it's like, of course, like that that makes complete sense that that would be holding it all together. That's the foundation. But then the work and the 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 stuff on top of it is, is what's going to like drive us forward and create that change. Yeah. Your, your plate can be very pretty, right? But if there's no food on it, right. You're really hungry, yeah. right? Like you're not going to get anywhere. Right. Right. Um, so you need that plate, but you got to have stuff on top of it. Too. That makes sense. That was a good visual. Others, other thoughts, questions? Because I definitely don't want you all to think that like intervention is all that matters, right? Any more than you should think relationships all that matter. We've got to have one first, and then we do the other. Um, so, sorry. oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to—I was just going to ask. So, what is it about this model specifically that that works so well with uh, with PTSD uh, clients with PTSD? Great, great question, Elijah. Um, so, when we think about uh, PTSD, from a cognitive behavioral standpoint, let's take a look at this, all right? So we've got uh, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral components. Um, our effective treatments for PTSD target very specifically these behavioral components. And the behavioral component that they target the most is avoidance of prior traumatic memory. Because when we continually avoid something, it turns out it doesn't make it go away. Right? 
and it doesn't make it just naturally better. So whether you're talking about prolonged exposure therapy or trauma-focused um, CBT or cognitive processing therapy or written exposure therapy, um, the core process that those are all really targeting are the behavioral components of avoidance. Uh, and it's avoidance, yes, sometimes of external events, but primarily it's avoidance of internal events. And it's avoidance of problematic emotions and problematic cognition. So by targeting those avoidance activities, what we do is we see that, hey, I'm breaking or extinguishing that negative, uh, maladaptive emotional response to a memory. Because that's what we're seeing in PTSD. Uh, it is my memories or triggers of those memories are causing me to feel very bad in various ways. And that can come out as anger, that can come out as fear, that can come out as anxiety, irritability, lots of different kinds of aspects. There. Um, and so by targeting those behaviors specifically, we then see the changes in cognition and emotion uh, that are beneficial as well. This is also why uh, a lot of, as you'll read about, uh, a lot of therapies that are out there that are supposedly to treat trauma uh, are so non-effective. It's because they don't target those aspects. Uh, or they posit ideas that are not based in reality. Like trauma is carried in specific parts of your body or something. Uh, wasn't this model made after, uh, and basically as a response to um, World War II and a bunch of those vets coming back with severe PTSD, or was it World War I, something along those lines? So most of our research on PTSD actually began uh, post-Vietnam. Uh, we have documented cases of PTSD literally going back to ancient Samaria, now, uh, where in some of our earliest stories and records, we see people returning from wars or people who were uh, you know, citizen casualties of wars uh, display the exact same kinds of symptoms that we now today recognize and call PTSD. Um, same thing for all major conflicts throughout time, uh, as well as natural disasters. Uh, like Samuel Pepys, for example, in his, his diaries from the Great London Fire very clearly is having PTSD after that. Uh, really interesting to see. Um, and so, you know, our, our models of, you know, what is causing it, what are the symptoms and how you treat it, that's changed a lot across time, uh, as well as what we call it. Like we call it shell shock in World War I, for example. Uh, battle fatigue in the Civil War. So this kind of a model in terms of a cognitive behavioral model of PTSD, really started to be uh, elucidated in the um, mid-1980s. And some of our first uh, really, really strong research on that from a cognitive behavioral model uh, was led by a woman named Edna Foa, uh, who developed our first effective treatments for PTSD, prolonged exposure therapy, uh, or PE for short. And so she was really placing a lot more emphasis initially on the Kind of the emotional processing uh, of, of work uh, or doing that work that's causing changes in emotional processing, um, whereas later models have focused more on kind of the behavioral uh, avoidance aspects that are then leading to more of what's called inhibitory learning. Um, so that's more kind of where we are today in terms of specifics. What was the reasoning for that shift from emotion to behavioral at the uh, time? Uh, the big reason is, is the research evidence uh, in terms of the last 40 years worth of research on, on what's actually changing when we do exposure-based treatments for PTSD uh, and kind of what's driving those problems in the first place, uh, which really seem to you know, start problematic from a behavioral level uh, and then bleed over into the cognitive uh, and emotional uh, realms, I should say. Uh, 
uh, if anyone's interested, I would be happy to, to post the talk I gave about uh, written exposure treatment, which talks about some of these things. Uh, I can put that up on our B2L shell if anybody's interested. In yes, please. I'll do it. Other questions, other thoughts? You guys are having great questions. Right. Well, so what I want to talk about next, you know, kind of, we talked about case formulation. We talked about how that starts translating into treatment plan. Um, but let's talk about what kind of that looks like. Though. Um, so what does that process look like and what are you going to be doing during that process? Right? Because you can't, just like Marcy had said, like, a, you know, um, I can't just sit there and just throw questions at you one after another and then expect you to start just doing whatever it is I tell you to do in therapy. Um, that would be wonderful if it worked, but it doesn't. Um, so instead, what we do in cognitive behavioral therapy is we place a lot of emphasis on these uh, separate but related aspects, what we call collaborative empiricism and guided discovery. And Doing this is something that really helps us get to that part of both having a good case formulation and then being able to implement our treatment. So, you know, like I already mentioned, uh, our, our treatment, our CBT you know, treatment is very individualized for each client. Okay? Um, all those variables that we talked about earlier that goes into case formulation, you know, those are things that change or shift how it is that I treat my clients. So while the basics are same, right, we're going to be doing psychoeducation, we're going to be doing homework, we're going to have session structure that leads us into specific you know, kinds of skills training. The basics are the same, but the particulars are very different. Um, and that's what you all will see across the workshops is the basics are the same, right? But the specific problems guide your treatment. And so this really um, goes to a, a term that's often used in the cognitive behavioral world, which is our treatment is all about flexibility within fidelity, not flexibility with infidelity. That's different. Okay? That's, that's something different. We're not talking about that in this class. We're talking about flexibility with infidelity. Um, and that means basically I'm doing cognitive behavioral treatment. Right? I'm sticking with what we know works in terms of the empirical data, but I'm flexing within that to individualize that treatment based on the specific needs of that child or adolescent that I'm working with. And so, you know, really our, our first thing, and this is what Marcy had asked about earlier, so we were getting there, Marcy. Uh, is is working alliance, right? And that therapeutic relationship. And that's our really our base for being able to do effective cognitive behavioral treatment. Um, if we don't have that, then we don't have very much. Now, who that strong alliance is with is also going to be different depending upon what treatment you're doing. So if I'm doing, for example, uh, parent-child interaction therapy, with a three-year-old with oppositional behavior, my working alliance is not necessarily going to be with that three-year-old. My working alliance is going to be with the parents that I'm working with. If I'm doing cognitive restructuring for a 17-year-old with depression, then my working alliance is probably going to be more with that 17-year-old than it will be with the parents. It'd be nice to have one there too, right? But the weight of it's going to be different. Just like it would be nice for the three-year-old to like me and have a good relationship, but it's less important than it is for the parents to have a strong relationship with me because of the kind of interventions we're doing. So that shifts just like everything else does in response to your case formulation. But one of the ways that we really enhance this and we really help build that strong relationship is by making sure that everyone understands that this is a team effort. When patients come to see me and their families come to see me, 
I'm not, you know, sitting up high on some sort of therapy throne, like doling out information. You must do this. You must do this. You must do this. Now go do those things. Right? No, this is a team, right? Like, yeah, I'm the expert in cognitive behavioral therapy, but you're the expert in you and your child and your lives. So let's work together so that we can combine our expertise in order to solve the problems that you're experiencing. And that's really what we're trying to do in cognitive behavioral therapy. But we have to start out with that collaboration, right? Like we're working together because if I'm working really hard and you're not, we're not going to get anywhere. If you know we're working for opposite goals, we're not going to get anywhere. We have to be collaborating and be a team. Now, how do you do this as a therapist? How do you build that collaboration? Well, you start out by addressing concerns, not just dismissing them. So when someone has a question for me about why are we doing what we're doing? How long is it going to take? How effective is this? I don't say things like, oh, well, just trust me. I say, okay, well, here's the answers to your questions. Like, and here's why those questions are legitimate. You know, I'm hearing your concerns and let's address those. Because when people dismiss our concerns, does it make us more or less likely to want to work with them and collaborate with them? Much less likely, right? Um, and you all know that from your personal life, right? Like if, if you go to see a physician and you just try and ask some questions of that physician and they just dismiss your questions or ignore them or say you don't even know them, you're not going to probably do the other things that the physician is asking. You're going to be like, oh, well, you know, she or he, like, they suck. They're not very good at this. Like, I'm not going to take that medicine. I'm not going to make this change they asked me to do. Same thing in a therapeutic relationship. One of the other ways that we really um, you know, help each other is by collaborating to determine homework. So I don't just dictate, here's what you're gonna do. Right? Here's what you need to go do. I say, here's what I'm thinking. Right? Here's the sort of thing that I think we need to do for homework. What do you think about that? Let's talk about that. What are your concerns? Right? Do you think it's doable? Do you think it's too much? Do um, you think it's going to help? Let's work together to determine how much of this we're going to do and what it's going to look like. So why would I do that? Well, because these people need to actually do the work that I'm giving them to do. Right? Um, and so if they're part of the creation of that, then they start to feel much more ownership of it, which means they're much more likely to actually work hard on it. Um, you all might see something similar to this in parts of this class, actually. Did I just assign everyone what workshop they were going to do and your partner? No. What did I have you do? I had you choose your own partners. I had you, you know, give me some options of what your ones you really wanted to work on were. Because now when I give that back to you, you feel much more ownership of that. This wasn't just given to you. I helped choose this. Now I'm going to do this. I'm going to be more excited about this. You know, tricky, right? I'm tricky. It's pretty fun. Uh, it's almost like you can use these same principles of learning how to treat psychopathology for how to help people learn other things. Crazy. Almost like behavioral principles transcend different environments. You know, it's completely insane. Completely insane. Uh, there it is. Now, one of the other things that you have to keep in mind as a practitioner, and you have to make sure that your your families that you're working with know, is that you're working with them. I'm not working on them. They're not a car, right? That I go out and work on. They're a group of humans that I'm working with. I am pairing with you to help you. Again, I'm not a dictator. I'm not, uh, you know, 
saying everyone must do this. No, we're working together. I'm going to help guide you. I probably have more expertise than you do in this particular area. But again, we're working together. And then the last thing is, you know, like I mentioned earlier, kind of remembering those basic micro counseling therapy skills and using those, putting those into play so that you're not just, you know, up there dictating, here's what you do, here's what you do, here's what you do, which is a very um, common stereotype of cognitive behavioral therapy action is that it's all just me bombarding you with questions and then telling you what to do or giving you a worksheet and telling you to fill this out. Um, I can't, <laughs> I can't even tell you how many times I've given workshops for folks who are not trained in CBT who watch me then, you know, do, you know, essentially sessions of CBT and tell me things like, wow, you're, you're a good counselor. Or like, you have good therapy skills. Well, thanks, but it's also kind of insulting, right? <laughs> like, it's not just because I'm a cognitive behavioral practitioner that I didn't have those skills. Like, no, that's what I got first. Just like you all in your first first year of training got those skills first, and then we build on top of them. Right? Then we can take the next step to do things that make this effective and not just placebo therapies. So even when I'm having people hold snakes and they have snake phobias. I'm still really caring. I'm not just mean about it, right? Um, some of you are like, eh, I'm pretty sure you are, but you'll, you'll, you'll see, you'll see. I'm not, I'm not that. Um, some of you have already seen me do that. Before, so. uh, and, you know, you have to have those in order to get people to do what it is that they need to do. So collaboration is key. Collaborations, questions, thoughts, responses from fully back. Everybody, it's making sense. Making sense, okay? Yeah. Uh, I just have a question. Like, could we go more in depth on like Rogarian skills? I've just never covered it before. That's right, it's just you're you're in our our school psych. Uh, so. You know, our, our sort of basic Rogerian skills um, of reflection, of empathy, uh, congruence. Yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. Elijah? Oh, I was just going to say congruence as well. Yeah, so um, you know, being able to kind of join with people. A lot of times now we talk about them as being what are called micro skills. Uh, and I'll actually, I can put up a um, video about micro skills uh, on the class for anybody who's interested in those. Um, but it's, um, you know, rapport, right? So developing rapport. Um, it's good attending skills. So um, verbal and nonverbal communication and attending. Uh, maintaining good and appropriate eye contact and showing interest. Uh, body positioning, so um, your posture, right? So as opposed to sitting here with my my arms crossed and my head down and a frown, right? So I've got an open, uh, relaxed body posture. Your vocal tone, um, which is kind of you know knowing how my my pitch, my volume, my tone are coming across. Being able to um, use what we call the basic listening sequence. Um, again, I can send this video out as well. Uh, but it's you know attentional skills um, for you know using open versus closed questions, uh, knowing how to paraphrase, paraphrase and reflect, uh, and then knowing how to summarize. And then um, you know when you put all those kinds of things together, that's really what we call these micro skills or these basic Rogerian skills. Um, and again, happy to send some of that stuff out uh, and put it up on the, the page as well. Did that answer your question, Tristan? Yes, it, the videos would be helpful. Okay. Uh, we'll certainly, certainly put those up. All right. Good. Other questions? Other questions in the box right now? Okay. 
Okay. All right. So, you know, we talked about collaborative empiricism and guided discoveries. Right? So we talked about the collaborative part. But what's the empiricism part? Well, that's where we're really referring to this uh, data-driven, data-based approach of cognitive behavioral therapy, where the data that I gather, which is going to include both things like formal assessment, as well as observation, as well as intake information, um, all that information comes in and allows me to transform those general treatments, cognitive behavioral therapy for OCD, into a very specific and ideographic treatment. Sue's cognitive behavioral therapy for OCD. Because when I do that with her, it's going to look a little different than it is with you know, John over here, who has different kinds of obsessions and different kinds of comorbidities. Again, the basics are going to look the same, but the specifics are going to differ, just like um, so many other areas of life, right? So, so two people can play the exact same song on the piano, but they'll probably sound a little bit differently, right? So they'll have the same structure, generally speaking, but they'll have their own interpretations of that based on what kind of piano they're doing, based on what uh, their skill level is, based on what their audience is, right? based on what their preferred style of music is. It's the same sort of thing that we're doing here in CBT. So I'm taking that, again, collaborative, yes, working together. Empiricism, meaning I don't lose sight of the data. Right? I don't lose sight of the research and the evidence-based treatments that have gotten to where I am. So keeping keeping those. And then we have guided discovery. And this is really just a, a broad name for teaching people how to more rationally stop and analyze their own behaviors and cognition. Now, we do this via lots of different kinds of techniques, uh, but this is, this is a, a core kind of idea of cognitive therapy is that I'm helping you become your own therapist. What I often tell my patients is that I work from a really terrible business model because I'm trying to make sure you don't need me. Right? I want you to be able to not come see me which is, again, a terrible business model, but it's a really great healing model. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help them in the future know how to approach these problems, know how to fix them themselves. And that's through different kinds of homework we give, that's through different kinds of behavioral experiments we have them do, that can be cognitive work, can be things like Socratic questioning or cognitive structuring. Uh, but the goal of all that is to have you be able to do the work that I'm doing with yourself. Right? Put me out of a job. That's what I want. And so when I have that, that collaboration mixed with empiricism, right, so that working together but from a scientifically informed model and knowing that you and I are going to work on this together, this guided discovery, these are the keys to having what we call a curiosity field session. Where both I and the people that I'm working with, the, the patients, clients, the families, et cetera, we're all curious. In other words, we're all becoming more flexible in our thinking. Because one of the things that really drives people to come into therapy is that they have gotten stuck. They're doing something over and over again, and it's not working. It's not working for them. So being curious allows us as therapists not to get stuck in one formulation, right? So it allows us to actually test and discard hypotheses as needed. Helps promote us to be more flexible about how we're viewing problems, and it starts promoting those same things in our Clients that we're working with. 
Because a lot of times when people come in, they've been doing the same thing over and over again, and it hasn't worked. But they keep doing the same thing over and over again. Well, I think we need to be a little more flexible in our thinking. We need to change what it is we think about what's causing this problem, what's maintaining this problem, and how we fix this problem. And that's what curiosity does from a therapeutic standpoint, is being open to saying, hey, let's let's try something. This is what you did try, this is what we've been doing. Let's try something new instead. And if you're fostering that and displaying that as a therapist, it's going to be much more likely that your clients will become open to that as well. But that also means you being open to their ideas and their input, which goes back to that collaboration. So again, this is a working partnership. Right? This is all about teamwork. This is all about coming together where you know we work together, but we still keep that empirical basis, like that hypothesis testing, data-driven focus, which in turn makes treatment very transparent. Here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I can tell you exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing. I share the formulation with you so that you understand why I'm doing it and suggesting the things that I'm doing. And then we work together through this guided discovery process to say, let's be open to change. Okay, let's see things as provisional instead of just 100% certain. And that goes for you know, me as a therapist and you as the client. And that goes for what you think is going to happen if something, you know, we do some of these interventions, like you, you think they're not going to work, which I hear all the time. So like, I don't think that's going to work. Well, let's try. Let's just try and see. Because I don't know, it might not. You're right. It might not work. But we won't know until we try. And I might be wrong, and I'm okay with that. But we won't know until we try. So, questions, thoughts, what we got? What we got? Let's take a little little brain break here. Uh, just look at each other for a minute. What we got? What we got going on? Thoughts, what's rolling around in your head? It's all right. So hearing... Um, the curiosity and then trying to teach your client to be able to do the skills that you're trying to teach them so that they can be successful in their own life <clears throat> reminds me of first grade. And I tell them, I can't jump in your body or your brain and make you think a certain way or act a certain way with a friend or work through a certain problem, but I'm going to give you these skills and I want to see you practice. So hearing you say that sound, I relate really strongly with that because you don't want to be doing the work to them or for them. You want them to feel empowered enough and feel like they're capable so that they can then carry it out in their day to days. But this all just makes so much sense with, and it seems like it, it makes it more fun too for, for us as a therapist to be able to, you know, work with the client and then see their empowerment along the way. I know that really this is kind of really like they've done it for themselves. And so I think I can see how the end result, some of the times, hopefully most of the time, can, um, you know, you can hopefully see that change with your client. So that this is, this spoke a lot. This is good. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think that's very, very accurate because, you know, a large part of what we're doing as therapists is teaching, right? It is teaching. I'm teaching you about why you're experiencing the problems you're having right now. I'm teaching you about ways to stop experiencing those problems. It's a different focus, right? Um, but, and I, you know, I could share with you all my, my teaching philosophy statements that I have, but they're all based around these same ideas and these same cognitive behavioral principles. Um, where my job is not to drag you along, right? My job is to walk with you. Every once in a while, I'll be like, oh, hey, look at that, or hey, pay attention to that. Uh, but my job is not to drag you kicking and streaming to the end of the class, or the therapists, you know, dragging their clients kicking and screaming to the end of therapy. I'm walking with you. It's collaboration. 
I'm trying to show you the way, I'm trying to help you out along those obstacles, but we're doing this together, right? I'm not working harder than you are necessarily. I think it's interesting um, working like doing school psychology and then having worked in ABA. My favorite thing to get from people is that, oh, ABA is so cold and just not specific to the kid. And I can understand where that comes from, especially because there have been a lot of people out there that have had really negative experiences with it. Um, but I think it's fun when we do have classes that overlap with um, other areas of psychology to see the overlap in each of our professions um, in our areas of study because CBT takes on a lot of what ABA does and ABA takes on a lot of what CBT does, um, especially when we're talking about kiddos that are having adaptive functions that are not, like their adaptive skills aren't great or their social skills aren't great or their emotional skills. We're teaching them those skills using a lot of the same methods that were used here. Academically, it looks a little different, um, but I think it's interesting to see that overlap and it gives a unique perspective. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the different kind of sub-disciplines in applied psychology, you know, have different languages they use, right? Uh, so ABA is, uh, I'm going to say, overflowing with unique terminology, right? Like uh, clinicians at ABA love to come up with a new term, right? Uh, they love it, uh, which is fine. Uh, and so, you know, you might use the term something like man, right? And then a CBT clinician is going to be like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> like, what are you talking about, man? I don't, I'm sorry, I looked in the dictionary, I didn't see that term, right? Um, but we're not all talking about different things, right? Um, you know, certainly as, you know, a CBT clinician, I will target um, directly cognitions more than like Dr. Singleton will as uh, a BCBA. But we're very much on the exact same level in terms of what we're doing, why we're doing, building relationships and rapport, conceptualizing cases, we use a little bit of different terms, we use a little bit of different terms for the interventions, right? But we're all on the same path in terms of evidence-based practitioners. I'm glad, I'm glad you're seeing that, Tristan. So is there a um, kind of a target goal of how many sessions this will take? Or is it just dependent on each client? Yeah, that's a great question, Marcy. Um, and the, the answer is, it depends on your formulation and on the client, right? So um, with phobias, uh, we can treat most phobias in a single session. Right, so a single what we call master mega session, where I might see you for three hours, but that's going to be it, and then I won't have to see you again. Um, if I'm going to treat PTSD, it's not going to be in a single session. So our shortest um, evidence-based PTSD work is a five-session protocol, this written exposure treatment. Um, if I'm doing parent management training, you're talking more about you know eight to ten to twelve sessions. If I'm working with someone who has, uh, you know, severe OCD, I'm probably talking, you know, 12 to 16 sessions with boosters at a regular interval afterwards. Uh, so there's no one like, oh, this is how everyone, <laughs> how many sessions everyone gets with this. Uh, it's more, okay, let's set your goals and let's see how long it takes to get to those goals with these interventions that we're using. And is that listed like within the manuals? Like if you find the one that you're tailoring to your client, does it say like, here's the suggested, you know, path moving forward? Yeah, so um, as you guys will see, as you start developing your workshops, as well as looking at other people's workshops, um, most of our problems have general outlines, right? So here's, you know, in general, here's what we do session one, here's what we do session two, here's what we do session three, and it'll take you, you know, roughly three to four months to go through all of this with your, your client. Um, but again, everybody's different, right? So it's not as if, okay, well, you didn't do your homework and you didn't seem to really get the skill from this session, 
we're just moving on. Like, no, 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 no. We will go back and we will make sure you have that skill before we can move on to the next one. Just like if I'm teaching uh, you know, people how to read and they can't get something phonetically, I don't go like, ah, well, never mind. Let's go to the next part. Or if I'm teaching math, it's like, you're having trouble with subtraction? Eh, it's fine. Let's go on to multiplication. You'll never use that subtraction again. Uh, like, no, you can, these, are, these are steps, right? Um, skills that build one off of another. Okay. Right, what else? What other questions we got? Thoughts or feedback? I know that you practice independently and don't take insurance. How could you talk about how you might approach cover as many sessions as you think that they need? Yeah, so that's a good good question, Zach. Um, so it's getting better because of some of the, the shifts and the changes at the federal level in terms of the insurance. Um, but there's still a lot of insurance that will be like, all right, you got six sessions. It's like, well, what? what? Well, I can do several things. One is I can, you know, apply for extensions, which are very often granted. Um, but then uh, that also is part of why, oh, part of what helps you to conceptualize how do I treat and what do I treat this? Right? So just like if I'm seeing someone, you know, even though I don't take insurance, I'm not just like, oh, here's our open-ended therapy. I will see you forever. Right? It's like, no, like, Here's what I'm thinking based on, you know, what you're presenting with and my formulation and how long these interventions generally take. Here's probably how many sessions will be. And I tell people that very upfront, right? Um, I say it could be less, it could be more, you know, part of that will shift and depend based on how you're doing. Um, but, you know, I'm pretty open about that. Now, if I have a very specific constraint on that, whether it's they only get six sessions reimbursed for their insurance and that's all they can afford or you know um, maybe they're an inpatient unit they're only going to be here for you know a week or two weeks what can i do within that time those are other things that you think about in your formulation and your treatment plan and particularly in terms of what interventions are going to make the most impact the most quickly so you know, I may not be able to spend as much time gathering information for my formulation as I would optimally like to before I need to go ahead and start doing some interventions. So my provisional formulation is going to inform which interventions I start trying, and then I start really taking that information and feeding it back into my formulation based on what happens. And just being ready and able to shift gears pretty quickly. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay. So do you ever come across TIBs that completely halt the progress of therapy, something like a, 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 a parent who might not just be willing to go along with it, like maybe like a, like a father that is um, very against uh, the the things that you're asking like the child to do if you're doing if you're working if the identified patient is the uh, uh is, is a child of theirs uh short answer is yes <laughs> short answer is yes uh and it's not that infrequent that we encounter those interfering behaviors. um part of your formulation is being able to anticipate those and then being able to say what do we need to do to get around so, um, for example, I may need to engage in some motivational interview with the parents or the child or both, right? Um, or I may need to, you know, depend on a transportation situation. Uh, say, okay, well, instead of just a 50-minute session, maybe we need to double up and do, you know, two sessions, two hours worth. Uh, so I not infrequently have people come see me from out of state. And they'll drive two or three or four hours and come see me um, pre pending. Now, that's a lot of driving <laughs> to then me see you just for 50 minutes and be done, right? 
So what I would normally do is I would do like doubling up on sessions and then doubling up on homework. And then a short brief call or you know a telehealth session in between those in-person sessions. So trying to look ahead and anticipate those behaviors so that they don't become complete and total stops to therapy uh, is an important part of your formulation. Okay, so would you um, would you ever think to uh, to just like to kind of switch, maybe change gears and focus on <clears throat> maybe that part uh, of the family system? Um, in order to get back to the like maybe that's a part of the the reason that there might be issues with the child yeah and it often right? those those um, therapy interfering behaviors are often not just a sort of free-floating thing but like they're critical and part of what's going on so um you know let's say one of the parents engages in harsh disciplinary practices that are not actually effective and they're making things worse and that's stemming from their beliefs about what do and do not, you know, make parenting effective. And I'm coming in saying, like, oh, the things you're doing, they're wrong, it turns out. Right? I mean, if I just come in and say that, that's probably not going to go too well, right? Um, but the those are some of those cultural and familial aspects that feed into our formulation, right? And from... Um, Mix up so I can show you Go back to this. So, from this kind of a, a perspective, uh, those kind of things, those therapy interfering behaviors, are likely to be triggers. They're likely to be contributing to core beliefs in some way, or they're likely to be um, impacting their contingencies or the behavioral skills or the classical conditioning aspect. So when, when someone talks to me about a family system, yes, I'm always thinking about the family system when I'm working with youth because those are things that are contributing to all of these aspects. Right? So I'm always taking those things into account. Now, I'm not going to then, as a, as a CBT clinician, I'm not sitting back and saying, all right, I'm going to completely change and I'm going to switch to doing a Bowenian family therapy to impact the system, I still say, yeah, I'm changing the system from a cognitive behavioral perspective. So I might need to do some psychoeducation and some motivation, maybe some cognitive restructuring work with that parent with these harsh disciplinary practices. And I might need to do some work with them in order to get them ready to do the work for their child. So I not infrequently um, work with parents who have similar problems to the ones they're bringing their children in. There's that old saying about uh, apples and trees, right? And they don't fall from far from each other. Um, and the problems that a lot of parents experience with their children are ones that they themselves have similar aspects to. So. Does that work into my formulation? Of course. Do I sometimes need to do therapy with the parents first before we can get to the child? Yes, very frequently. Um, especially if their therapy interfering behaviors, you know, are the same similar ones that their child children are showing in terms of seeing these problems. High levels of anxiety, avoidance, substance use, uh, lack of motivation and engagement, withdrawal, things like that. Okay, and I guess that goes along really well with uh, the personalization aspect of, of this therapy. Yes, because it is, right? It's not just everybody who walks in who has a child with oppositional behaviors gets this exact same thing. It's like, no, here's the general structure to it and how we would treat those. But all these families are going to be unique which is why we have to ideographically mold that to them, as opposed to just applying it to everyone. So if so much of this is obviously dependent upon the client's willingness to work with you and, and what you're asking them to do, 
at what point are you like, they're just not going to do it. And I either need to change course completely or cut them and find a different avenue for them. I mean, how do you know when that line is? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so how, how do you know whether or not what I'm doing is ineffective? Or is there something going on with this system that I'm working with, this team that I'm working with, that's making them ineffective, right? Um, and a lot of that is following the data that you gather in terms of what changes are or are not occurring within a family. So if, for example, you know, data is coming in showing that this family is repeatedly not doing and engaging in their homework assignments, or they're not doing the homework assignments as you're trying to get them to do them, right? So doing them wrong. Um, that can tell me that, okay, there's, you know, maybe there's some skills deficits present within this family that we have to address first, or there's some motivational deficits within this family that we have to address first. So, when I see someone stalling in therapy, my first reaction is always, okay, is it me, right? Like, is the intervention that I'm trying to do working or not working? Because if it's the intervention, then that means I need to change my formulation. I need to discard that hypothesis, develop a new one, see what new intervention we need to use. If I don't know if the intervention is working or not because the family or the child or the adolescent isn't doing the intervention. Then that doesn't tell me if my intervention is effective or not. That tells me we don't know because they're not doing it. So what I need to address then is what it is that's causing them to not be able to do that which could be, like Elijah had said, you know, some sort of therapy interfering behavior, or it could be a larger structural issue. Um, you know, there's lots of different reasons why those things come up, but those all play into our formulation and our understanding of what is and isn't going to work. Is that maybe a little bit of answer? Yes. yes. It's just always, that's always the tricky part for me is like, okay, when do you say, this is just not working with us or you know just how you draw those lines and those boundaries yeah and, and i think a, a crucial part of that marcy is understanding why it isn't working um so like i i, I consider myself a pretty good therapist right Other people seem to consider me a pretty good therapist but that also that doesn't mean that i think i can help everybody and that doesn't mean that I'm the right therapist for everyone. Um, I had a girl with OCD, who was 16, referred to me a couple of years ago. Um, and I saw her for about four sessions. Uh, and then I referred her to somebody else. And it wasn't because the interventions weren't working. They were. It was because she really just didn't feel comfortable working with a male therapist. She just didn't. And she finally came out and was very open about that. And that's why she was reluctant to do some of the work and why she was a little off. She was like, I just don't want to work with a, a man. I want to work with a woman. And I was like, well, why didn't you tell me that? That's fine. I'm not going to get upset, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to refer you to someone who's going to be the most effective to help you. Um, and that could be based on gender. That could be based on um ethnicity and race, that could be based on religious background, that could be based on location, that could be based on language preference. There's so many different things that can be based on, um, and that's fine if that's what's causing it as opposed to me doing an ineffective intervention in poor time. Does that answer your question? We're going to wrap it up there. Next week, we're still meeting virtually. Um, the university has decided. I'll see you back here at the same bat time and same bat channel, uh, 2 p.m. next Thursday. Uh, I will work on and send out your assignments uh, in terms of your 
your workshops and when you're doing those. So I'm going to do that now before my next class. And uh, you let me know if you need anything or have any other questions, okay? All right. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate you. And I will see you.